Good morning. My name is Rick Isaacs, and I'm a pipe organ builder. And I can't tell you how many people have been by my booth and said, what is this guy doing here? <laughs> and I'm here because John Bruner is a, amongst his other talents, he's an organist, and he had recently played our new instrument at Harvard University. And he called and asked if I would like to be here as a counterpoint uh, to all of this technology. So here I am. And this is, our, this is an instrument that we built uh, some tw uh, 20 years ago in the Meyerson Symphony Hall in Dallas, Texas. And it was the first really large tracker action that's, that involves direct mechanical connection from the keyboard to the valves of the pipes, you'll learn more later, uh, built in this, in this century. And it's a, it's a marvelous instrument in a marvelous IMP building. So now... That was my friend, my good friend, David Briggs, also a former neighbor in Ipswich, Massachusetts, now lives in Toronto. And he was playing this instrument, which is in the church of Saint-Sulpice in Paris. And this instrument was originally built in the 1750s by a French organ builder named Clicquot. And it was rebuilt and enlarged in 1862 by one of our touchstones, Aristide Cavier Cole and it was rebuilt in the French symphonic style. Now let's fast forward 150 years in organ building to this place. This is Seagerstrom Hall in Costa Mesa, California, and we're about to hear uh, the organist Christoph Bull play on this organ, and watch what happens. You, if, you may have noticed when you were seeing David Briggs playing, a lot of keys moving that he wasn't touching and watch for that in this next clip. Now let's go back to uh, just have a little look at Fisk's magnum opus. This is, a, this is an instrument that we built in Lausanne, Switzerland about 11 years ago. And uh, it was the largest instrument that we've ever built. And it was the first uh, American instrument in a European Gothic cathedral in this century. So what a, you, we've just spanned 150 years of, of, of organ building. And what's really changed? What are the major technical differences that we've spanned over 150 years? Well, we're proud to say very little. <laughs> this, <laughs> what's this guy doing here? <laughs> uh, the changes that have been made is, uh, is these guys, I don't know how they designed organs 150 years ago, because I, I use 3D AutoCAD, and I, I couldn't live without it. Uh, I'm, I'm the mechanical key action designer there. But what has changed in the world of organ building is we had, a, we had a, I hope I don't insult my fellow organ builders, we had a kind of a dark period in organ building between, uh, between the early 20th century and the 1960s when the fascination with technical things, with, with 
the ability to use electricity and switches and relays and electromagnets and uh, banks of switches to, uh, to open magnets uh, at, the, at the at or near the base of pipes to admit wind came to be a, a really big fad. And people found that you could build pipe organs uh, very large and more cheaply uh, by, by using magnets and switches. So here's the, here's the point where, where I'm going to ask, how many people out here play any kind of a musical instrument? Yeah, how many people play like a wind instrument, like a clarinet or something? How, how, would you, how would you like your clarinet, instead of having it in your mouth, to be blown by an electric blower, and then all the little valves being played, well, what you do is you'd close a switch somewhere and a little magnet would close those valves. Would that, would that be satisfactory? <laughs> And how many people play like a guitar or that, that sort of instrument? And similarly, would you like it to be strummed by something with a little motor and then have, uh, th then have it played uh, with, with little magnets? Of course, the, the answer is not. Um, so the, our founder, Charles Fisk, who, was, uh, who died, unfortunately, in 1983, I had the pleasure to, to work with him just a, just a little bit. Uh, made a conscious decision to revert to the old ways in the 1960s. It was, was called the organ revolution. And he, he purposely turned the clock back and formed our entire company in 1961 around the idea that we would return to the old ways of organ building, of directly connecting the key with little, little levers and uh, little levers and things called squares and roller boards. To the, to the valves. And it's especially interesting because Charles Fisk was, a, he majored in nuclear physics at Harvard and Stanford. And at Harvard and Stanford, there are both instruments built by either Fisk or his company. So when he was at Stanford as, an, as, a, as a nuclear physics major, he decided that he would instead create a new major for himself of pipe organ building. So what, what, what what's goes on? What is, a, what is a pipe organ? Well, here's one at Rice University in, in uh, Houston, Texas. And here's a keyboard on that organ. And every one, of the, every one of those keys, we're talking key action now, there's 61 keys, is directly connected to a valve at the base of a pipe. And that gives, that gives you some real advantages because you're, you're playing a musical instrument and you can feel, when you press that key, you can feel what we call the pluck of admitting wind into the base of that pipe. And that pipe can feel how you're pressing that, that key. So if you press it very quickly, you get a more percussive attack. If you press it more slowly, you get a more languorous attack. And it's amazing how a concert organist can vary that touch when playing at lightly, lightning speed. So what is a pipe organ really? I've added this since I, I hooked together this, uh, this thing. It's a piece of hardware. It's a musical machine that has co-evolved with the writing of software, organ music, over the last 400 years and more. So that's, a, a, that's another way of saying that the music has been written for the existing pipe organs because they live Pipe organs last for hundreds of years. The music's been written for those, and those pipe organs have risen to the occasion, the pipe organ builders have risen to the occasion of writing for the performers. Organ pipes uh, in a... Uh, could, could I have that last slide back, please? So, so behind those facade pipes in that organ, and the largest ones are almost 30 feet tall, weigh hundreds of pounds, made of tin and lead, made in our shop, Oh, I'm sorry, those were made by, a, by a, one of our suppliers. Behind all that are thousands of pipes. There's probably, I think, 4,000 pipes in that organ. And they range in size from like a pencil, that looks sort of like this, to th those 32-foot tall uh, monsters that you see. And, in, and inside, they weigh, the biggest pipes weigh like 500 pounds. That plays one note in a pipe organ. Um, <clears throat> So what you have when you go to the console is you've got 61 keys 
and they're spread over three manuals. Each of those manuals is, uh, is almost like a, a, it's like a different character of sound. And then you see stop knobs arrayed around the side, and all of those are individual uh, stops within those divisions, those manual divisions, and the pedal as well, I shouldn't leave the pedal out, that, that, that have individual characters. Some are imitative of, of an orchestra, so it'll be called things like string or oboe or something, and some are absolutely characteristic to pipe organ sound, and they'll have name, names like, like, uh, like principal or something. But what we're really talking about here is the key action. Those, those operate through uh, solenoids and happily the, the stops operate uh, through a computer system. But the keys are directly connected to the valves. And that's what's important to us. So uh, what I'm going to do is give you a little, a little animation of a, of a key action working. Uh, we developed this for a film that we made. So you see the player is pressing the key. That's moving a carbon fiber sticker going up to a square to a roller board. That motion is being carried out from the span of the keyboard out, you know, 10, 20 feet to the width of the organ. And it's pulling open that that thing called, a, we call it a pallet, it's a valve, and all the different stops, they're arrayed with things called sliders. And this is a really quick explanation. And, and sliders, they just, they just either line up the holes or they don't. So it plays or it, or it doesn't. But uh, when the slider the holes are lined up and that pallet is uh, opened, that's what makes a pipe organ play. So Little pictures of the gazintas of a pipe organ. This is, this is one, of our, uh, one of our pipe organ builders, Nami Hamada. She's a voicer. She's one of the people that makes pipes sound the way they do. But she's also a keyboard maker. And the title of my presentation, of course, is Musical Counterpoint in Wood. You've seen wood. Uh, bone. And what you see here is bone. We, we don't use elephants. We use, uh, the, the, we use the, uh, sh the thigh bone of cows. Uh, metal and carbon fiber, and you'll see all of these things in what we do. Uh, here's yours truly measuring the tension that it takes to press down a key. Uh, there's a picture of, of a roller board in a, behind a console. All this is, look, you, don't, you haven't seen a wire yet, have you? <clears throat> these are carbon fiber stickers, wood bone and carbon fiber, which are working uh, a roller board at, the, at our organ in uh, Harvard University. And there's some wood, some little levers that do coupling. Um, this is an instrument that, uh, that uh, is at Caltech, just down the road here in San Luis Obispo. It's, it's one of our large concert hall instruments. So, what's, what's, what's really, how can we, when you, play a, when you play one of these valves, it takes about 100, 150 grams to open it, and that's fine. And in the, in the old, old days, back in box time, you'd couple two or three manuals together, coupling those, those keyboards together, and you'd, you'd, be able to, uh, you'd be able to play that pretty easily. So it's, but when you, when you get to the French symphonic organ, which is a, which is a large, large instrument, like, like David Briggs played on the opening, you, you can be playing up to 15 of those valves at one time. So do some quick, some quick arithmetic of uh, 150 grams times 15, and you're well to the north of two kilograms of force on each key. And you can't play that. And so, Aristide Cavier-Cole, ta-da! Aristide Cavier-Cole in the, in the mid-19th century, worked with a man named Charles Spackman Barker, who was an Englishman, who developed a thing called the Barker lever. And the Barker lever was a pneumatic device that amplified the force of the organist's, of the organist's pressure on the key. And it was a binary device. When he pressed the key down, it pulled open the valve in the organ in a, in a kindly fashion, not like an electromagnet would, but in a kindly fashion. And... <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> and, uh, 
and, and let it go. So one of the changes that we've made, we've made changes in material, you've seen carbon fiber, whatever. One of, one of our, uh, our people named Stephen Coalition, and he, he loves writing his name in Cyrillic on his label, he, he improved on, on uh, Mr. Barker's invention, and he turned that binary valve into an analog device. And so I'm, let's see, what, if the camera wants to zoom in here, so what's happening here is I'm, it almost looks like I'm scratching my back through a motor, but I'm not. So when, when I press this key, it's moving this input lever and the force of the, the compressed air in this box, and it's not much, it's, it's about six inches, 150 millimeters, hold your nose, go to the bottom of the bathtub, that's about how much it is, on this bellows is collapsing in and it's multiplying the force of myself on the key by one heck of a lot. And I urge you all to come by, stop by and visit. I'll have this set up and working uh, next to my, my booth is next to my friends at Blackberry. If, uh, if you have any, uh, <laughs> so you, you'll find that you can barely, you can barely hold this valve back, but it's tracking my finger exactly. So that's, this is the, uh, the it's called the Coalition Servo Pneumatic Lever, and it's, it's, it's a major technical advance in pipe organ building, <laughs> and it's made out of, <laughs> it's made out of wood. <laughs> and it's made of another advanced new material. I replaced the, uh, goat, the baby goat skin we used to use, because I love goats, with Tyvek, and with much, much testing, we've been unable to destroy Tyvek, and it's, it's damn cheap, too. <laughs> so it's great stuff. So we, we have returned to first principles of organ building. We, we, we've returned to haptics, the importance of touch, the importance of feel, the importance of, of the organ, organist knowing exactly when the note is going to play and feeling the pressure of that organ back on him and of him exerting pressure on, on the organ. Um, I'm, I'm just going to flip through some organ porn here. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I just want you to know that beneath these gorgeous facades, and these are all speaking pipes, by the way, uh, are contraptions like this made of, uh, made of wood and aluminum and steel and carbon fiber. This is an instrument that we built in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. This is our newest instrument at Harvard University. It replaces, it's in the rear gallery and it replaces one that Charles Fisk built in the 1960s. Uh, this is on the Gold Coast of Chicago at St. Chrysostom's Church. This is in Lexington, Virginia. This is our newest instrument in Niza, Japan. It's in a chapel of a high school at Rikyo University. Um, and that's it. There we go. It was, this was counterpoint to all this high tech with some low tech in wood, bone, metal, and carbon fiber. <laughs>